Welcome to Engaging Culture, a podcast presented by Bridgeway Christian Church. I'm Brian Kiley, and today on the podcast, Pastor Lance Hahn and I will continue a three-part series entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Pro-Life? Today, we will be talking about some of the theological and philosophical convictions that guide our thinking about life issues, asking questions like, what constitutes a pro-life issue, and how should we think about life and death as Christians? Then we will move into a conversation about the death penalty, asking, should Christians support the death penalty? If so, under what circumstances? And if not, why not? All of that and more on this episode of Engaging Culture. Well, hello. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 22 of the Engaging Culture Podcast. As I said, my name is Brian, joined as always by Pastor Lance Hahn. Lance, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. You ready to go? Yes, I am. I'm fired up. I always feel like we come in, we sit in the studio, and uh, like we're getting all prepared, and then it's like, okay, it's 11 o'clock, go now. Yes. And now I feel very flustered. But Yes, then we get all jammed up against (laughs) our time frames. We're just gonna we're just gonna jump right in and and uh, we're gonna have a good time. So we're in a three part series mm-hmm. on what does it mean to be pro life. Last week we talked guns and gun control, and there ended up being I felt like a lot more agreement between the two of us than I think maybe either one of us was expecting. How disappointing! <laughs> it was really disappointing. <laughs> we're gonna try to fix that today with our conversation. We about most the death certainly <laughs> will. Death penalty. But I'll tell you what was encouraging to me is is is. First of all, I had probably more people talk to me about that episode than any other episode of our podcast, which is a little bit weird to me, but yeah. it is what it is. Okay. Uh, and, and I was encouraged by, for the most part, uh, our listeners and just different people that I talked to seem to appreciate, wow, it's nice to actually hear a conversation where mm-hmm. two people can be very passionate about an issue, but just talk about it like normal humans and not get all screamy and judgy and angry and all that stuff. I'm certainly so. hoping we will continue <laughs> to do that today. Here's, here's what's We've funny. Let me precedent. set up this podcast yep. with this con- concept. Right. Yep. You and I get along super well. Yep. And I am always championing you about like whatever. You always hear me down and, the hall. I'm and constantly. Vice, and, and vice versa. I'm always sure. talking about how awesome you are. And none of that changes <laughs> yep. today. Yep. I'm in a really weird position because, <laughs> dang, I totally disagree with you, man. And I'm like, I'm looking at this going, I'm just getting angry so, while I was doing prep for this. So so we have both just, I, I feel like this is relevant too to the conversation, is is just so those of you listening are aware. So Lance shared with me a lot of the reasoning behind his position. And then, so I've read all of that. And Lance, if you don't know this about him, is a content producing machine. <laughs> he will just overwhelm you <laughs> yeah. with material. And and so I worked through that and kind of noted areas of agreement and disagreement. And then last night I went through and I typed out like, here's sort of my case for why I'm against the death penalty. And I sent that to him and he read it like an hour ago. <laughs> so Dude. It's, it's fresh and it's, oh, uh, we're ready to, ready to rock. But, um, before we get into that, uh, I, I did want to just a few other things to, to, to recap uh, from last week, and then we want to get into kind of some philosophical issues that are guiding the conversation. And, and the first is this, is just talking about uh, what is the purpose of doing this series? There are a few things we're hoping to accomplish uh, through uh, through these three episodes that, w- that we're going to do. Who knows? Maybe we'll expand beyond that. But uh, Lance, could you maybe speak to some of the, the reasons why we're doing this series, and then you... I'll pick up wherever you leave off. Yeah, probably the most important thing is that there are a variety of societal issues that all deal within a similar concept. So, for example, we laid out for our listeners that we were talking about things like gun control and then war and then military and police action, all the way down to the concepts of death penalty, euthanasia, abortion, things like that. Well, they all have something in common. And what is in common is is a debate about life Mm -hmm. and the sanctity of life. And we use these phrases, oh, I'm pro-life, as if someone else is pro-death. Right, which right. is totally unfair. Right. Um, so, for example, what you're going to hear is that I am pro death penalty. That does not mean I'm not pro life. And so, um, instead of trying to handle all of these individually and keep making the same points over and over and over, right. we said, what if we gathered them together in a shortened series, combined a few concepts, mm-hmm. and talked about the idea of pro life and where does life have limitations to it? And so in wrapping that whole thing into a ball, ta-da, this is what you got. Here we go. Yeah. No, and I think that it is, I mean, and I think you're right, that certainly sometimes the the rhetoric can can be a little bit unhelpful. I mean, you know, I to me, and as we're, we'll get into this, obviously, being against the death penalty is part of being pro-life. But I don't think being for the death penalty makes you necessarily pro-death, much like uh, I believe 
uh, gun control is absolutely a pro-life issue. Like that is not that is not a well maybe like issue in my in my mind. But nobody is pro more violence. Like I get that. I'm not going to say that somebody who is against gun control is pro gun violence. Like that's that's different and that's an unfair characterization. Um, but I do think here, here's part of why I think this is important is that I think it's important for Christians to think more holistically about what does it mean to protect life? What does it mean to be consistent in our position on different issues? One, because I think life is precious and should be protected. But two, I think what a lot of Christians don't understand is that the world is looking at us and saying, well, you care an awful lot about abortion. Why don't you care about these other life issues? And it, it to me, it takes away some of our effectiveness. Now, we could go the other direction and say, well, why do all you people that are so into gun control, why don't you care more about, about abortion? And that is a fair argument to make, but just because they're getting it wrong doesn't mean we should get it wrong too. So my thought is we just need to look more holistically at what does it mean to protect life? What does it mean to honor life? What does it mean to recognize God as the author of life and death and to recognize that that encompasses a host of issues? Yeah. So here's something funny. While I'm listening to you, you're lacing it through with your perspective. I, l- I think that oh, is hilarious. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm listening, I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. I don't even agree with what you just said. So this is why this is so yeah. fascinating to me. Uh, once again, I want to point out to our listeners and viewers that, that um, once again, we are buddies. We're going to be buddies after this. Um, we may get into significant uh, debate. But but I think, once again, we're stepping even more into the area of saying, how do you have healthy debate yep. um, at, at any time, even when you are super passionate and you're fired up and you want to you know get angry about something? Right. There is an appropriate and respectful way to do that, and then there's not. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to try, wherever possible, <laughs> to acknowledge when he makes a good point. That'll probably never happen. Uh, that's so true. you don't have to worry about that. Well, yeah, just, that's why I said be- it. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't need to say that because you were already thinking it. Right. Well, and, and I think also um, it's it's interesting to me just throughout my life, and this is probably true for you too. I just feel like I have I have engaged with people from uh, who just have so many different beliefs on a lot yes. of different issues. I even within the Christian community, I know I'm in the minority in the way that I think about a lot of different stuff. So so to me. The idea that I would have friends, that I would hug people in our church lobby who whose views on these subjects are just so contrary to my own. Yep. That's just that just is not a stress point for me at all. I, I just I have no issue with that. I mean, now again, much like in this conversation, as we get into discussing the issue, like sure, I'll press for my point of view. But I think it's important for for Christians especially just to recognize like Christians think a lot of different ways about a lot of different issues. And like the world is already looking at all the ways we divide saying, uh, what, what's that all about? And, and we need to recognize we don't have to agree on everything to be friends, to do ministry together, to do life together. If anything, when we model unity in disagreement, uh, that to me is a powerful witness to the world. Well, I want to clarify one thing that you said, because um, the way that I heard it and the way that I think that you intended it are, are a little different. You said hugging people that are different is not, just not a stress point for you. Um, now I want to I want to clarify. I don't think that was entirely true because I think that on some of these issues, you and I have had dialogues where we think that somebody's contrary opinion is damaging. We think it's actually harming people and it's harming society, and we get kind of fired up mm-hmm. where we're like, "No, I'm not okay with that." They don't just mm-hmm. get to have an opinion. It, their opinion impacts things. Yeah. So I think it is a stress point. I think it is a tension point. I think your maturity level then says, what do I do with that stress point? Uh-huh. I then have to say, I have to put it into a more holistic way to say, and just because I am stressed about your impact on the world, I can embrace you because, and then you would fill in the gap. Why? Does that make sense? I, yeah. didn't, want it to, I didn't want people to think that you're like, and who cares what people think? It's not a big deal. It is a big deal, and you still hug them. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? I think that's a good clarification. No, I, I, I would agree with you. Because other people are going to go, <laughs> well, you don't care. I do care, so that's why I'm rude to people. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. <laughs> no, no, no. We care, right. and it is a stress point. Yeah. But what we have to do is we have to mature through that and say we are consistently embracing people of disagreement. Yeah. 
And I guess it's just it's the idea that oh I you know I can't talk to somebody because we disagree on an issue or we can't be friends. I just I don't know. It's I, not it's, appropriate. It's silly. So, it is silly. Anyway, yep. okay. I, I, you know I hope that we can we can uh, certainly model that, but then just help people recognize also that and even this is you know I get in these conversations occasionally where people want to know um, you know what's the Bridgeway stance on X Y and Z. Right. Uh, you know or having to have conversations with people like hey while you're representing Bridgeway as a as a volunteer like you can't be wearing stuff that like takes a stand on a hot button social issue like do that at the grocery store i don't care but when you're representing like because people are going to associate you with like yes you know you're this is the church's stance and and i always want to help people recognize that we don't take stands institutionally on a lot of those issues rather we say uh you know we we might want to speak into them we want to say what does the scriptures have to say about them uh but as we're going to see here on staff we don't always have a unified front and to say that like you're welcome here Kind yes. of wherever you are on the spectrum of a lot of stuff. Well, so. we do an awful lot of regional um, work, and we're uniting with across many, many different streams, different right. denominational streams, different concepts. And once again, we're embracing, and we truly mean the embrace. Yeah. But we are not saying that we agree with everything. Yeah. And and that our church is made up of that, mm-hmm. which is wow. If we're not on the core issue, the core issues, right? The divinity of Jesus, things like. If we're not on those core issues. Man, we have so much disagreement, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, as we continue forward, we, we want to talk a little bit about just some some sort of philosophical and, and theological convictions that that Pastor Lance and I are, are bringing into this conversation. That uh, we have not really prepped this part with each other much, so we'll kind of see how this goes in terms of uh, just to what extent we agree or how we would nuance some things differently. But uh, both looking back to our conversation about guns last week, looking ahead to different conversations we'll have in, in the weeks to come, and then certainly for our conversation today, it's important to recognize what are some, some issues issues we bring to the table. And I'm looking at our outline and I made some bullet points of things that I wanted to say, uh, Lance. So I don't know if those are things you want to say also or not, but just so you're wondering, in case you're wondering, that's why they're there. But why don't you go ahead and and, and just talk about what are some kind of big picture ideas that, that you're bringing to these conversations? Yeah. Okay. So this is a place where Pastor Brian and I agree an awful lot. So I'm just going to throw out some stuff if you could just interject some comments. Sure. But um, like on our sheet that we have prepped before us, uh, when I sent out my points initially, you put little red marks. So you would say agree, agree, or disagree, and then you would put your points. Well, in this area, there's an awful lot of agreement. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to go through these because I think that they are foundational mm-hmm. to where we're going to move next. Yeah. All right. So here we go. As a Christian, the biblical worldview is that this universe is primarily about God, not mankind. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you go, no, he made this whole universe for us. And whoa, 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 whoa. This is his stuff. He's the creator. Creator gets to dictate purpose. Creator's more important than the created. So Mm -hmm. no matter where we're going to go, we got to realize it is all about God more than it's all about mankind. Mankind's not the biggest deal. Yeah. We believe, now this is where we can diverge, uh-huh. not you and I, but, but listeners. People, people in general. People in general, is that we believe <laughs> at Bridgeway, and the, the senior leadership has had an agreement, that we primarily believe, or we believe that mankind is here for two primary reasons, at least. Mm-hmm. Glory to God and relationship with God. Those mm-hmm. are kind of some foundational tools that we've built upon. So our lives are valuable insofar as we are doing our created purpose, Mm -hmm. giving glory to God, relationship with God. Now, the reason why those are important is that later on, we're going to be talking about just being alive. To me, I see that very different. I don't see Mm -hmm. simply being in existence is valuable as much as aligning with our created purpose. Okay, Okay. So I'm going to get into that in a moment. Uh, Another thing, we both agree that death is not the end. So when we say physical death, that is not the end. Mm -hmm. We will eternally exist either in in presence of God Mm -hmm. or apart from the presence of God. We don't need to get into all the details and everything else. We are not believers in annihilation theory. So we believe that the spirit of mankind is eternal, and it will always have an eternal dwelling place. Yes. Now, so death here is not the end. Um, Now, we believe that for... Um, that death is, uh, and I maybe I don't know if we totally agree. I think we do, but death is a doorway to what is more real. 
okay? Yes. Meaning that what we're in, if we're going to play the little Matrix you know, movie <laughs> game, we're in kind of a, a, a fake thing that what is more real existed before us, and that is the spiritual realm. We are currently in something that God made, but there's a whole bigger picture going on around us that we are kind of ignorant of, mm-hmm. um, the throne room of heaven and stuff like that. That's more real than what we have. Now, for believers, death is better. We, th- we, we both agree on that. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul the Apostle said that, you know what, I'd rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay, and he said, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So for a Christian, death is better. Mm-hmm. Um, for a non-believer, death is a lockdown of right. saying, and seen. Right? Right. Like, we are done with this part. (laughs) We're now going to move on to the eternal part. All right. Right. So here's the other thing. I am pro-life by my definitions. Mm -hmm. You are pro-life by your definitions. Neither one of us is pro-death. Right. Okay? So uh, it just because I'm going to be arguing a whole bunch of things about death does not mean that, man, I love death. Death is good. Death freaks me out, quite frankly. Right. Not a big fan of it. All right. So here is where I think that we're going to just wrap up a couple things. Maintaining life, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. is not the main goal. Our goal in this life is not to stay alive at all costs as if this life was the greatest thing. Our goal is living this life in alignment with the will of God and in relationship with him along the way until we are by his side. Now, that is something that you said in the past. You're like, okay, I agree with that. Uh, yes, yes. I, would, I do agree with that. Okay. And then um, the other piece I think that we agree on is an obsession with earthly life to, to demonstrates an unhealthy interest. And here's what I mean. It means that when we are having an improper view of this world, a value of this world, there's a lot of us that don't long for heaven. Right. We actually like this place better. Yeah. Heaven is unknown. This is what we like. Yeah. So we will do anything and everything lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, distort, whatever, to right. stay alive. Right. I don't believe that that is healthy. I think there's something wrong with that. Yes. There there are, um, and certainly these issue, these these ideas are controversial, and forgive me, we had some technical difficulties that distracted me for a moment, but I was still listening uh, to what you were saying. Uh, yeah, simply maintaining life at all costs, if we're going to talk about sort of pure pro-life and all of that, that is probably the biggest hit on my record is that I do think there are cases where the preservation of life just for the sake of preserving it right. is questionable and potentially not helpful and potentially um, could, and I, I want to be careful not to paint with broad, broad strokes here, but but could reflect to your point, an overvaluing of this as kind of all there is and an undervaluing of, of yes. eternity. And so that's going to get into something that people are going to attach what I'm about to say to their immediate assumptions. Uh-huh. I would like to caution our listeners on what I'm about to say. I believe that life is not valuable insofar as quality of life is valuable. Now, here's okay. what I mean. Now, people are going to attach that, but let me say something. Okay. Our lives are valuable insofar we are doing what we were built to do. Simply living is not glorifying to God. Existing is not glorifying Just to God. Existence kind of without anything else attached to it. That is not glorifying is not, to God. Okay. The, the Bible is very clear. There are people that are not glorifying God. Yes. But they're alive. Right. Okay. So that's not simply living is not a win for eternity. Simply living is not benefiting anyone. Like we are taking up resources that may be used on someone else. Right. More life is not necessarily better in terms of population problems. If we said, uh, uh, we're going to overload, we have too many people. Right. Just because there's more people, that does not mean better. Okay. Does that make yes. any sense? Yep. So, oh, yeah, certainly. for example, Absolutely. if we're all on an island <laughs> and there's a limited amount of resources and we have a huge amount of people, there's everyone seven dies. Seven million of us. <laughs> everyone dies. So we can't say that that's better. Yeah, all right. Right. Only life that is lived in alignment with the Father is ultimately beneficial spiritually. Right. The uh, rest, yes. Jesus calls scattering abroad. Okay. Now, here's what I didn't say. If you're not a Christian, you're not valuable. That's not what I just said. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm talking about from a spiritual perspective. All right. Now, last couple points that we agree on, then we'll spend the rest of the time disagreeing. Um, everybody dies. Yes. Okay. So Enoch and Elijah didn't die in the Bible. Pretty much everyone else did. So that is a 99.9% everyone's going to die. The only yes. thing we're ever going to discuss is a matter of timing. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> so you can die sooner, you can die later, you're going to die. Yeah. Everybody dies. Uh-huh. Um, and then um, more time on this planet, the last point, more time on this planet really doesn't do extremely valuable stuff for God. Um God can work in any time frames, right? So uh-huh. if they're unsaved, somebody's unsaved, God knows that. God knows mm-hmm. their limitations. God knows their fallibility. Mm-hmm. So God is working with a limited, weakened group of people, mm-hmm. and he knows that. Okay. okay? So, so far, yeah. we're all in agreement. Yeah, yes? Yes. All right, all great. Now we're going to step into where we're not. Okay, so here's how this is going to go for, for, for our listeners. I think... And so I think you and I are clear on how we're going to do this, but just in case, um, it'll be a little bit different than than some past episodes in that there maybe won't be quite as much quick back and forth as we as we usually do. Um, instead, so you'll just sort of maybe br- very briefly, and we talked about this already, we've very briefly lay out kind of how best you would summarize your position on the death penalty in, say, 30 seconds or less, and then I will do the same. And then what we're going to do is... You're going to lay out your case and maybe in the course of that, just to break things up, I'll ask some clarifying questions or whatever, but I'm not going to respond. And then I'll lay out my case and same, you can ask some clarifying questions, but we won't really respond. And then in whatever time we have left, we'll respond to each other a little bit, maybe engage with one another's arguments um, and just sort of see where that takes us. So that's the plan. Uh, 30 seconds or less, Lance, why don't you just kind of outline your position on the death penalty? Uh, Okay. So I am pro death penalty in specific cases, all right, which means there are certain reasons that the state would put someone to death. Now, the reason why is I believe that as God is the author of life and everything we laid out before, Mm -hmm. that God empowers authority to carry out necessary justice. And having said that, that means that I think it is necessary for accountability I think it is necessary for punishment. I think it is necessary for deterrence for future crime. And I believe it is necessary for containment. Now, so in a short wrap-up reason, that is my stance, that I believe it is a necessary part of justice of a submitting of a right, uh, a submitting of a freedom. Okay. Uh, Life is... A gift, Mm -hmm. your ability to move around this world is a gift. Mm -hmm. That needs to be forfeited in certain cases, just as all punishment is a forfeiture of some type of freedom. That's it. All right, there you go. Okay, so I am against the the death penalty in in all cases. Um, we were discussing before the show, you know, how, how would you respond if it was somebody close to you? And, and I brought this up and, and I just want to be honest. I, I don't know. I don't know how I would respond in that case. I hope I would be consistent and that I would not want the death penalty for somebody. If, you know, God forbid a loved one of mine, you know, were a victim of a crime like that, but, uh, I'm against the death penalty. I am against uh, state sponsored killing across the board, uh, with the, with possible exceptions for, for some police action situations. Um, I think that to take, what God said to Israel in the Old Testament and to try to apply that uh, in the New Testament and in the New Testament world and certainly in 21st century America is is highly problematic. Um, so I have a lot of theological reasons why I'm against uh, the state determining who lives and who dies. Um, I think that's fundamentally different than believing that God is the author of life and death. And I said this in the notes I sent you. I sound like a libertarian when I start talking about the state's thing over life and death, which do I'm not a libertarian. Know? I do, but I'm not that at all. But uh, I, I guess I kind of am a little bit when it comes to these sorts of... Th- anyway, if you're a libertarian, sorry if I'm misrepresenting you. That's not my intent. Anyway... Um, so I'm against it theologically. I'm against it practically because I don't think it works for, for a wide range of reasons, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into. And I'm against it... And so I'm against it for those two reasons... Even if I wasn't a Christian, and even if I believed it worked, it had the potential to work, I would be against it as it currently work, as it currently functions in our society today because I think there are significant uh, inequities in the application of the rule of law and the application of, of justice. So uh, those are, in brief, scattershot summary, some of my reasons for being against the death penalty. So with that... Um, 
Lance, why don't you go ahead and, and lay out your case? And I, I guess I just want to give one final preface to this, and you can you can respond to this if you want, is that I think for our listeners, I, I don't know that the goal in the conversation today is to convince each other. I think we're pretty well entrenched in our positions, and who knows? Maybe this will move the needle a little bit. And it's not even necessarily to convince you. I mean, you know, I think we both, anytime you're presenting why you think a certain way, I think you want people to agree. Of course, of but course. The point more than that is just to recognize that there is a lot of gray in this issue and that there's not a cut and dry, every Christian thinks this way. And I I hope more than anything that we can present that as we're explaining our respective positions. Yeah. uh, One other disclaimer before I go into this, uh, just to back up what you said, here's what I love the most is that you and I are both convinced, but we became convinced looking through theological lenses. Yes. We we believe that Scripture or the God's heart goes this direction. Mm -hmm. We did not just simply say, who cares about the Bible? Who cares about God's opinion? This is my opinion. Right. I don't believe that is acceptable in any Christian's life to be able to put that on the back burner and say that because of my political affiliation or because of whatever, I'm going to affirm this whether or not God likes it. Right. So you and I are very convinced that we believe we are representing the heart of God. Mm -hmm. That's what I love the most, because if someone does align with your viewpoint, they would be able to say, okay, but he looked at Scripture. Mm -hmm. He did look through these lenses, Mm -hmm. and I can feel relatively peaceful of saying, okay, I've looked at it too. Mm -hmm. I have so much respect for that. So, okay. I think that's good. All right, let's hear it. Here we go. So let's start with that concept of biblical reasons why I am pro-death penalty. So here's my line of thinking and my line of reasoning. And it was funny. I said uh, in my notes, I wrote, simply put, God is pro-death penalty. This is like the biggest manipulative statement And I basically wrote, uh, no, he's not. Yes, that is exactly right. I was like, well, God's on my side. He's not on your side. Well, I guess we're done here. Yeah. Um, So here's what I meant by that. I'll I'll flesh that out a little bit. uh, God is pro-death penalty. And here's what I meant. God is the author of life. He can give it and he can take it away. That is totally his right. We do not have a right above him, Mm -hmm. anything. And he exercises that right a lot. Mm -hmm. God kills people a lot. Now, however we want to call it, he kills people a lot. Now, Uh You're obviously going to lay out some uh, uh, opinions in a moment here, Uh and you would not disagree that God is the author of life. Actually, we're still on the same thing. You separate out state-sponsored killing versus God's author of life. So here's where we're going to start diverging. Mm -hmm. I believe very firmly that the Bible is replete with evidence that God empowers his people to kill people. And so, for example, um, everything from Israel as a nation. Now, Israel being a theocracy is a very different environment than what we call America as a democracy. I don't actually believe that America is totally a democracy, but that's a different point. But a theocracy means governed by God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Israel's very unique in how they handle things. The reason why I'm going to highlight them a lot is I don't believe that they equate to our society, but they demonstrate the heart of God. So I believe God empowered his people to kill people. So for example, all death penalty cases were were heard by the authorities of Israel. They were empowered to execute God's judgment. So it was not God killing them. He empowered the state to kill them. That was the point. The Levites did that. And even in areas of the judges, He empowered and gave extra power to Gideon to kill people. He empowered and gave extra power to Samson to kill people. He empowered and gave extra power. So he always works through people. So separating out and saying God can kill anyone. No, no, no. He kills through people. Unless you're doing an act of God, tornado, hurricane, it is through people. So I believe he set up a justice system by which he moves through institutions to carry out his will. Now, One thing that I think is really, really important is that we have the same God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes, oh, the Old Testament is all bloody and this and that. New Testament's all purified. That is incorrect. There is death and killing and really hard stuff in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people want to make the book of Revelation completely poetic and metaphor. I completely disagree. I did a whole year on Revelation. Mm -hmm. I've dug into Revelation backward and forward. Mm -hmm. It is not all poetry. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the same Jesus that did the Sermon on the Mount of, I, you know, you've heard it said, don't murder people. I said, don't hate people. That same Jesus comes riding in with King of Kings on his thigh and slaughters nations. So anyway, same God, both sides. How things are carried out in his point of view is what we would end up disagreeing on. All right. Um, I believe that the fear of God and fear of death is necessary as a motivator and deterrent. Why? Primarily because God says so. He said, and I did these things so that you would fear God and fear punishment. You can't just do whatever you want. All human beings don't do things because they're afraid of the consequences. So, for example, one of the problems we've had with online modern day is people can do things anonymously. Mm -hmm. They turn monstrous because there's no accountability. So any penalty or accountability changes behavior. I don't, we can get into all the statistics. Everyone argues statistics. And I don't know if you knew this, but nine out of 10 statistics are made up. <laughs> so I totally just but made that up. What about the other one? Yeah, exactly. So the bottom line is it's always a deterrent. Now, the idea is that you would go, man, well, the reason I don't road rage is because it's not worth it. What are you saying? There's a, de- there's a deterrent because of consequence. All right, moving on. So human institutions are placed by God to execute judgment. So, for example, 1 Peter 2.13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be emperor as supreme or governor sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good, for this is the will of God. Okay, so fear God, honor the emperor. Great. If you want to go old school, what I was talking about, the judges and the Levites and all that, that's Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 13, and 2 Chronicles 19, 5 through 7. All right, so last pieces. These are my logical reasons why. Okay. So just to clarify, yes. so, these, this, so this is your, that was kind of a... a, a Uber simplistic biblical argument. 30,000 foot view of your biblical view. Now we're going to step away from the explicitly biblical argument into more kind of logical reasons. Now those are informed by your theological convictions, of course, but just to clarify, we're kind of stepping into a different type of reasoning here. Beautiful clarification. All right. Accountability. Here's the deal. With every bad decision, there are consequences. All punishment is a removal of something we value. A child in timeout is a removal of their freedom to play. Mm Mm-hmm. A court fine is the removal of hard-earned money that could be used for something else. Mm-hmm. Jail time is a removal of freedom and privileges. Death penalty is a removal of the freedom of life. Life is a privilege. People do not have the right to do anything they want without forfeiting something they have. One person's freedoms do not get to remove another person's freedoms in the sense of private individuals. Mm -hmm. I believe there are crimes which demand the removal and handing over of life by the perpetrator. But since it will not be handed over, it must be removed by the governing body. So this is my argument for accountability. The second one is punishment. Um, the punishment and justice brought down uh, by the death penalty provides some semblance of justice and closure to those devastated by the crime. So when we talk about punishment, the idea that – and we, we're going to get into this whole argument later about whether it helps the families or doesn't help the people devastated by the crime. Uh-huh. Here's the bottom line. To know that someone brutally devastated someone else yet will be provided for the rest of their lives comfort. Uh, food, shelter, abilities to have access to everything, freedom, and cared for for the rest of their lives when they devastated and destroyed and ripped apart someone else's is not a good idea in my opinion. I don't think that's an equal – I don't think that's a helpful system. Okay. Um, And then the the last two is deterrent. Um, People don't go around killing other people because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them. Okay. So once again, we've already talked Sorry. enough about the deterrent issue. Yeah. I don't want to get into it again. But punishment raises awareness. It's the case all over society, so no statistics are going to tell me any different. That's ridiculous. Um, Wait, clarify that. Sorry. Um, that um, all people in society do not do certain things because of the cost. Got it. Okay. That is just a fact of life. It's not. It doesn't matter what statistics say about that. Everyone just in wisdom can see the reason you don't go 120 miles per hour on the road is not because you're afraid of driving 120 miles. It's because you don't want to pay a ticket. 
Mm-hmm. There is a cost, so you curb your behavior by cost. The reason you don't steal something, you would go, well, that's not fair to them. Well, some people don't have that, so their only deterrent is it's not worth me going to jail for something stupid like a purse. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so deterrence is penalty. All right. Last one is containment. Um, People still can and are murdered in jail. They can carry on their reign of terror. If somebody is a psychopath... And and I don't mean that in a clinical term. Right. I mean, well, although it tends to coincide, <laughs> could, could be. Yeah. But I mean that in a bit more loose term, which is, I w- I don't care about other people. I want to destroy them. They actually can continue their reign of terror in jail. Mm-hmm. So they can cons- they can harm other people. They can molest other people. They can cause a lot of pr- problems. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the death penalty is this person is so at a place of disrepair that containment has to go beyond jail time and it goes to a ceasing of life. All right. So that's it. Okay. Ta-da! All right. So there, there we go. That's the, uh, um, there's kind of your, your case and a few different, uh, f- taking it from a few different angles. Um, Man, I just feel like there's so much there for us to unpack. <laughs> but for the I sake of, of 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 maintaining some semblance of order here, uh, I will just we're just gonna let that ride, and then we'll we're gonna get into my stuff, and then after I finish, you can just tell me how I was wrong. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I I would uh, place my. <laughs> Another thing, I'm just going to say this. I always am so annoyed that I feel like I come under these podcasts. We're talking about all these big issues, and I know we're talking about them, and I still did not spend adequate time getting everything we together. We will never, but it's never spend gonna adequate time. <laughs> we probably shouldn't, frankly. We have too much to do. Anyway, so I would put my uh, my objection to the death penalty into three different categories, theological, uh, practical, and justice. So my theological objections to the death penalty fall into two categories. One I have referenced already is that I am theologically against uh, killing in the name of the state, again, with appropriate allowances for situations where uh, police action is truly necessary necessary. I believe it is very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to put together a biblical case for Christians killing in the name of a secular state, and that even passages that seem to condone some measure of state-sponsored violence, like Romans 13, for example, uh, those are speaking more of the function of the state rather than Christian participation in in it, um, and I would I would argue as well that passages like Romans thirteen need to be read alongside passages like Revelation thirteen, which uh, have a much more kind of nonviolent uh, bent to them. Uh, my second objection theologically is that it is difficult, if not impossible, to use the New Testament to construct a positive case uh, for Christians using lethal violence. And and I, I know that any time I've ever said that anywhere in my life, people immediately go to the book of Revelation. I believe the, Re- the book of Revelation, and I wrote a paper on this in seminary. If you're having trouble sleeping, I'll send it to you. It'll put you right to sleep. Uh, I wrote a paper on uh, a nonviolent reading of the book of Revelation and understanding how actually the book of Revelation not interpreting it allegorically, recognizing that Jesus returns as a conquering king and all of that, that that still uh, supports, I believe, my argument for Christian non-participation in acts of violence. Here, I think it's important to pause and for me to clarify that, again, I think God is the author of life and death. God is, a lo- God is allowed to bring forth life. He is allowed to take it away. He, it all belongs to him. So in the book of Revelation, Jesus... First of well, you know what? Never mind. I'm getting off on too big of a tangent. I want to get back to my original argument. It's difficult to construct a positive argument for Christians killing in the New Testament. Concepts like grace, mercy, forgiveness are found throughout the New Testament as are repeated warnings against anger and vengeance. Uh, God shows vengeance, but he also says in Romans that vengeance is his. And that's important for us to recognize because God can show vengeance and when he does it, he does it rightly. Every single one of us has experience in a small case, hopefully, or in some of us in a larger situation where, uh, where where we have taken out vengeance on somebody else in a way that was inappropriate, in a way that was immature, in a way that was too emotionally charged to really be effective. Uh, Human beings in general, and I'm having, I say in general, I I don't know that there's an exception to this, but human beings are not good at executing vengeance properly. So, uh, and then as that relates to the issue of the death penalty, when someone is executed, 
it immediately ends any possibility for mercy, for forgiveness, for transformation and reconciliation. Uh, I am very much pro punishment for those who commit heinous crimes. Uh, I, I believe that there absolutely should be accountability. I mean, to the issue of deterrence, I think that punishments absolutely are deterrents. I have a hard time with the reasoning of somebody would kill somebody because they'll spend their life in prison as opposed to somebody would, would, but that same person saying, well, no, I don't want to kill somebody because if I do, I'll spend 20 years in jail and then face the death penalty. I have a hard time believing that that would create a, a difference in a person's actions. Um, I also, I mean, I find it difficult to reconcile the death penalty with the idea that everyone is made in God's image. Uh, I have a hard time reconciling the death penalty uh, with what Christ taught throughout his ministry, that nobody is beyond redemption. Uh, The death penalty necessarily cuts off the redemptive process in the life of a person uh, who faces that faith. You can no longer be redeemed after you are dead. Uh, There's no longer opportunity for repentance, for change, for anything like that. I think also it's important to recognize because a lot of um, you didn't bring this up specifically, but oftentimes we hear about, uh, well, eye for an eye, like this was taught in the Old Testament, eye for an eye. And I think this is so important, not just for issues of the death penalty, but just for issues of life in general and the way we interact with those who are wronged, that eye for an eye was not meant to be a license. It was meant to be a limit. It was meant to be, uh, hey, if you, uh, you know, let your dog wander onto my property and he poops on my lawn, like it's not okay for me to go burn down your house. Now, some would argue it'd be immature for me to let my dog poop on your lawn, but that's beside the point. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's meant to be, okay, no, 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 you can take back exactly what happened, but then that's it. So, so it was a limitation of vengeance, not a license to execute it. And then also, uh, Jesus taught us a better way. He said, you've heard it, you know, you've heard it taught, but I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, so I think we have a really hard time, first of all, recognizing eye for an eye is a limit. And then Jesus saying, no, 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 I've taught you a better way. What else do I have to say? Uh, some of the greatest heroes of our faith are murderers. Uh, Moses, David, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. They were redeemed by God to do great things. Uh, core to Christian ethics is our belief in redemption and grace. And the problem with redemption and grace is those things cannot be experienced without pain. I would love to become a forgiving person without having people wrong me. (laughs) I'd love to become a patient person without having my life be difficult, but that's just not how it works. Uh, And that if anything, heinous crimes give us an opportunity to witness to redemption and grace, which does not mean we're anti-punishment, but it does mean, I do think it means we're anti-death penalty. Um, It also is important to recognize, and granted, we're centuries later, you know, after this, but the pre-Constantinian church and, you know, the early followers of Jesus, they were consistently pro-life. They didn't go out and fight wars. They didn't execute people. This just didn't happen. The the early church was, in fact, consistently pro-life. And then kind of my last uh, theological point is simply just the reality that when we end somebody's life, we rob them of the possibility of what God's grace might do in them. Now, we can take a perspective of, oh, well, God already knows. He knows what's going on. And certainly there's some truth to that. But nevertheless, we end somebody's life. We end the possibility of God continuing to do something restorative in them. So those are some of my arguments there. The practical side, I will freely admit, gets a little bit more messy. I think that We could scour the internet, both of us, and find victim stories to support our case. You know, like you could find somebody to say, well, you know, this terrible thing happened. It was, I mean, I'm I'm kind of caricaturing a little bit here, but this terrible thing happened. And my gosh, just the closure it brought me knowing that individual is no longer on the planet was healing to me. I, I freely admit those exist. There are also those who say, you know, that actually did not close the wound, if anything, it made it worse because just the cycle of violence is continuing. I think at best, the idea that the death penalty provides closure uh, is you could you could argue both sides on that one. Um, Furthermore, the way the death penalty works in the United States, I mean, it's decades of trials and appeals and all of that stuff. So if anything, it just reopens the wound for victims for a long, long, long period of time. I'm against the death penalty practically because it's a huge waste of money. I mean, it ta- it costs a ton of money. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I you know, conservative liberal, I don't I don't take those labels, but to me, it does not make sense for a fiscally conservative person to be pro death penalty because it simply costs way more than life uh, in jail. Um, 
to speak of deterrence, uh, the death penalty is not a deterrent for violent crime. It's just not. There are studies have shown this to be true. A vast majority of law enforcement representatives agree. Uh, I read just last night a survey of nationwide police chiefs. The death penalty was ranked last on a list of effective ways to reduce crimes. Do harsh punishments reduce crime? Yes, they do. Uh, so I'm not against harsh and stiff sentencing um, when it's used appropriately, particularly for violent crime. But the idea that the death penalty specifically deters crime um, the vast majority of the evidence out there suggests that is not uh, that is not the case. Um, also, it, it's interesting just that according to the FBI, states with the death penalty have the highest murder rates. Um, what else do I have? Oh. One more practical reason I'm against it. The only countries that execute more people per capita than the United States are China, Syria, Iran, and Iraq, which is hardly a who's who of human rights champions. (laughs) Like, that's just not the group you want to be in when you're like, yes, we really care about people. So those are some practical concerns. Um, Finally, justice concerns. For every nine people who are executed on death row, one has been exonerated. That is a huge deal. Like, if that was the only reason to oppose the death penalty, that would be a good one, in my opinion. 156 people who are on death row up to this point have been exonerated. Not just having their sentences commuted to life in prison, but exonerated, found innocent. That is an emergency to me. Uh, There's also tremendous racial bias when it comes to the death penalty. Two of the biggest determinants of whether or not a murderer gets executed is the race of the defendant and the race of the victim. Uh, In 1950, African Americans made up 22% of the population, but they accounted for 75% of those who were executed. And today, there are uh, African Americans make up 12% of the population, but they account for half of those on death row and a third of people who are who are executed. And this, perhaps even more striking, 2% of counties account for over half of all death penalty sentences, meaning your zip code. Uh, has a, is a major determinant on whether or not you will face the death penalty. That, to me, uh, just seems wrong. And uh, one kind of famous anti-death penalty advocate is, has used this phrase where he said, you talk about the death penalty executing the worst of the worst. That's not what happens. We execute the poorest of the poor. We execute people who commit terrible crimes and do not have the means to properly defend themselves, whereas those who do have the means to properly defend themselves, uh, generally speaking, do not face the death penalty. So the death penalty is very, very inconsistently applied in America and is very clearly unjust. And it's a symptom of greater injustice in the criminal justice system, which is a, you know, another conversation for another day. But when you're talking about the life and death of human beings, that's a big deal. So there is my scattershot approach to all the reasons why I'm against the death penalty. And I think I might actually see steam coming from your keyboard. You were <laughs> typing so much as I was talking. Yeah. So in the time we have left, yeah. uh, feel free. You can just respond to anything that I said, sure. or maybe I'll respond to some of what you said, and let's go. Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, uh, all right. So what I was trying to write down was just um, some counterpoints back and forth. Um, so I think that one of the biggest differences between you and I all boils down to, um, one concept for me, and that is you see it as personal. I see it as practical. So for example, whenever there, you made a lot of points that had to do with, well, God says there should be grace and mercy and forgiveness. And, and you speak of anger and vengeance. None of that is in my purview. I don't okay. believe it has anything to do with personal. It can't be personal. I believe that 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 per, the, there's a big difference between killing and murder. We're, we would get into this a lot a lot more in another mm-hmm. argument, but killing and murder are very very different. And so the idea of personal vengeance, we are not executing the death penalty because someone says, um, "You hurt me, they must die." That is not that is not what the death penalty is about. It is not about it is about a more practical system of saying there is a forfeiture. So okay. it has nothing to do with grace and mercy and forgiveness. The, oh, the state's not giving them grace and mercy and forgiveness. The state has no interest in that at all. It's simply a practical system of saying if you do this, that when, when someone, when, you, when cops put someone in jail for stealing, mm-hmm. that is not a retribution, I'm angry at you, how dare you. It's a simple practicality. You violated this, you are going to go here. There's no personal heart in it. So grace and mercy and forgiveness have nothing to do with it. Those have to do with the individuals involved. 
Yeah, so, and I guess I would see that differently. That's only my because point. To me, yeah. I think that I think that you can make the argument that removing somebody from society is not an act of vengeance. I just have a hard time seeing how the killing of somebody is not, in some level, an act of collective vengeance. Okay. Killing somebody who is not actively trying. Now, it's one thing if you've got an uh, active shooter situation and it's like you need to stop this or more people are going to die. Sure. It's another thing if you've got somebody behind oh, bars, totally contained. Threat, you know, like to yeah. me, I I just have a hard time. Okay, with but that. that's what I'm telling you is this is a fundamental difference in you and I because in my opinion it's now been removed away from the emotions it's no longer someone being angry at somebody it is much more into a system of saying this is a violation of this it has this consequence because that's how we do it meaning this is our our agreement it's unacceptable there's not the judge is not getting angry the attorneys aren't getting angry. Nobody else, they're so removed from that, there's no personal retribution. The, the victim's families don't get to have a say. That's part of the system. Mm -hmm. They actually get moved out until you get to victim statements and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but, but here's the thing, nobody is doing it because, so if that was the case, then we would base our justice system on the excitement level of the, of the perpetrated. In other words, we don't make our judgments based on, are you really angry about it? <laughs> then we're yeah. going to give you 10 years. Are uh -huh. you not so angry about it? We'll give you three years. Right. Nobody says that. Mm -hmm. It's a set system that says this has this consequence. It doesn't matter whether you're fired up about it. It doesn't matter whether or not you don't care. The victim's families, that is not how we define the law. Okay. The law is defined as you do this, you forfeit this, regardless of how people feel about it. So that's why for me, any discussions of, well, we're supposed to be graceful and merciful, that has nothing to do with it. Okay, well, let me let me pose this question yeah. then. It's, um, it's one thing to say, okay, within a, a secular state, mm -hmm. we create a system where, I mean, I, I still don't totally agree with you that, sure. that vengeance is removed, even though the, the emotion's cool and, you know, all that. But, so but, what's okay. the vengeance? Tell me that real quick. Uh, to what me, is I the just, vengeance? I, Nobody I, has I, a personal stake in yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think you can have vengeance without sort of emotions getting hot. I think there is some level okay. of, I think when you, when you get to the point of removing someone's life, uh-huh. I just, to me, and and why is okay? I, I'm trying to think of a counterexample to my own point before I make it. I I just have a hard time. <laughs> I have a hard time with the idea that taking of a life mm -hmm. is not on some level a vengeful act, I even if yeah. it is being removed. So I, I guess yeah, we'll just have to disagree on that point. Once again, yeah, right. and that's what I'm saying. That is a fundamental difference. Yeah. yeah. Between so the so here's the question I want to ask, mm -hmm. though, is is let's just say, okay, let's say I concede that point that, okay, within a secular state, which mm -hmm. America is, we, we say, all right, we've set up a system where there needs to be this removal and, you know, we need to, okay, you, you commit these heinous crimes and, and you need to forfeit your yes. life. Yep. And you can say, okay, institutionally, we're not talking grace, mercy, redemption, it's got these, sort of, to do with these it. Christian yeah. values. Even if that's the case, mm -hmm. shouldn't Christians still want grace, mercy, and redemption for these people? Even if we decide as a society institutionally, like that's not going to be a, a value? Right. Okay. So that, that goes to my next point. Okay. Okay. So one of your points was it ends the possibility of transformation, redemption, and repentance. I disagree completely. Okay. Um, I actually am that person that you were referring to before that says we're always working within a limited structure and God works within that structure. Uh -huh. I think that's completely bogus that in some way we've shorthanded God. God, man, we cut your process short, buddy. Sorry about that. You can't work within this structure. Um, you really wanted to work with them long-term transformation and we cut it short. I think that's totally ignorant of the sovereignty of God of going, you don't shut down me. Mm -hmm. You've got nothing to do with that. If I really wanted to, I would have worked with them when they were three years old. Mm -hmm. I would have had them in a process of transformation way before now. You're mm -hmm. not stopping me. Mm -hmm. So the argument that somehow it stops transformation or redemption falls flat because I believe that a higher view of God is that he's orchestrating and moving pieces with always having a limited. So he knows a bus is going to hit somebody and they're going to die at 13. He's been mm -hmm. working on their transformation up to that point. The bus didn't stop his process. So, so on some level then, if if God really wanted to keep him alive, he'd figure out a way to do Absol it. Well, yeah, and he could have easily steered them away from that. There's no ability of a human being to ruin God's ability to transform somebody. He would have worked backwards from that. So that, that, that whole thing about, oh, no, we stopped him. 
oh no, we ruined his process. I don't see that anywhere in scripture. I, that's just not something I can agree with. I mean, on some level, I agree with you that yes, that that, that God, you know, God, our God is in the heavens; He does what He chooses. Right. Like, we are not totally. going to short circuit His yes. process. Uh, but at the same time, I think that you look at the history of kind of redemption. You uh-huh. look at the things yeah. that God has done. You look at the healing that He has worked out in somebody's life. I mean, it gets very—I don't know. Ethere- he, yeah, go ahead. It gets very ethereal to begin to say, "Well, you know, uh, because this person was executed, we can be confident that had they lived another ten or twenty years, that God would have done nothing in their life." No, no, no. It, I think God does something in their life, but I don't think that you would say it, they could have gone worse. Mm-hmm. Hezekiah got fifteen more years and screwed everything up. So the idea of extending life. Life, that's my that goes back to my initial point I don't think that that's how it does how it works uh, God when God killed the guy who touched reached out and touched the ark mm-hmm. right killed that guy instantly mm-hmm. what you're saying he had no more transformation for that guy I'm just saying that whole thing is a straw argument because God always works with limitation mm-hmm. he has people that are only living back then what 65 75 years mm-hmm. That is a limitation by itself. If God really needed more time, he would have extended them back to the Methuselah era, right? Back to Mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. He shrunk it down. Why? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. God isn't limited by our limitations. Whether And if we say if that's true, well, putting him in jail ruins more transformation. They still don't have access to a bunch of the church services. They don't have access to all these other people. Every, well, yeah, but that's different I, than killing them. No, it's not. I mean, yeah, it is. There's no, at least some possibility there. Okay, but, to, but you know. you're assuming that God has no creativity but only to work through our systems. Like he's like, oh, man, gosh, they, now they're dead. I don't I don't know. I couldn't work with that. Mm-hmm. I, I, so I, that's a, I'm talking about fundamental differences between you and I. Okay. First of all, it's not personal at all. It's got nothing to do with forgiveness. That okay. is something that the victim's families have to work out on their own. They have to work through forgiveness. That's what Jesus calls. Okay. It's, they're not the ones killing them. If we had a society where you said, we're going to go in gladiator mode, and you're going to let that person get really angry, we're going to tie that person up, and you get to hack them to death, I would have a problem. Mm-hmm. Because that is a direct vengeance. That is mm-hmm. direct. We need to have mercy and forgiveness. Totally different argument. So in my opinion, this is fundamentally different. Um, the other one was saying that, you know, this whole idea, well... Uh, the early church was was more pacifist, and it was this and that. I think the whole idea of nonviolence is a very tiny, limited view of the world. The world has been consumed with necessary violence all the time since the, the dawn of creation. And the idea that we're now in safe little America, and you get to <laughs> do, make all these decisions in a gated community, it's kind of like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is very limited. We've got to blow it out where you have people being warred upon and being destroyed and everyone trying to kill everyone in Israel and trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. And you have all that is real. And so the idea of theoretically saying, no, we all have the ability to just be peaceful and say, I just don't think that's a fuller yeah. picture of what God has had to work with. Well, I mean, you can make that argument, but the fact remains that, uh, and, and certainly there was violence in Israel's history, and, and we're getting a little bit off track from, oh, totally. from death penalty into violence. Right. But I think, the, but I, but I do think that it is an important thing to point out that for the first, you know, pre, really pre-Constantine, the early mm-hmm. church. Uh, did not fight in the Roman army because they were in God's army. The early church did not practice capital punishment. The early church had a respect for the sanctity of life that extended beyond, uh, you know, kind of maybe the typical issues we think about today. Now, the early church also had a lot of problems. So I'm not necessarily saying that that's like nope. the argument that solves everything. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I think it is important to recognize that before Christianity got mixed up with the state, that nonviolence was an extremely high value and it was very broadly applied. Yes. Uh, okay. We will we will argue about that later. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other one is I want to just reiterate something that you said that um, I think is important for Christians to realize, uh-huh. and that is let's say let's say I'm king and my way goes. Mm-hmm. We have death penalty and everything else. As a Christian's participation in the state, you can opt out. Meaning, if you have a conviction that Pastor Brian has. No, there are certain things you do not want to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Like if the state is doing that, you as a Christian can say, I do not believe that that is affirming of my heart and what God has called me to do. I cannot do this role. 
I cannot do this job. Mm -hmm. I cannot be a part of this. It violates my conscience. I just mm -hmm. want to back up that if that is their view, please follow that. Please follow your conscience. Please mm -hmm. opt out and say that's not... I don't believe in war. Well, don't join the military. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to do. You see what I'm saying? Like, I just want that to doesn't back make that, up. Like, that doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean you're not. No. A, you don't love your country. It doesn't. You know. Anyway. No, I just wanted to back yeah. that up. Thank you. Okay, so as far as practical stuff, um, I we talked about closure for families. Uh -huh. Once again, I would argue that closure is a very limited thing for me. Mm -hmm. My problem, and this is where you and I will agree, uh -huh. uh, relatively, uh, the American process is jacked up. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's your arguments and arguments that are similar that has screwed up the process. The whole let's make it take 20 years of over and over and over and over rehash that trying to carry out judgment mm -hmm. is way more expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a complete hassle. It drags the victims through it over and over and over again. So I think we have a broken justice system of process. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that the concept of a punishment or an execution or forfeiture of life is not appropriate. It just means we have a bad process. That's that. I, I think that's a fair argument to make. However, I think the the uh, and, and you know much of my kind of my final third of my argument yes. was all about the process. Absolutely. And and the issue is not just time. I mean, I remember as a younger person, sort of working through like, what do I think about the death penalty? I mean, I think I started being you know pro and well I'm obviously not anymore um, <laughs> is I thought to myself like this is silly why are we having 20 years of trials yes. like okay let's just figure it out and then just yeah. <laughs> do the deed you know sorry to be crass about it but yes. um, but uh, that is one part of the problem with the system is that mm -hmm. it takes forever yeah but the crazy thing about it is exactly what I brought up earlier which is to say even with all of that mm -hmm. like we execute innocent people <laughs> you know? okay, like that's yeah. a real he problem now here's this is where I'm going to sound really harsh bring it <laughs> okay in every punishment system there is error so for example and that's unfortunately how it has to go mm -hmm. because we're dealing with human beings so mm -hmm. for example one of the things i made my mom cry about this this is so sad <laughs> i let her know later on that she spanked me one time now i've only been spanked by my mom as far as i know three times okay one of them was an unjust spanking. Oh, boy. <laughs> I didn't do what I was... Right, okay, you're right. That did happen. Mm -hmm. That is always the point, mm -hmm. that there is going to be an injustice. Now, I'm going to argue that's part of living in human society, mm -hmm. that you're going to also have people that are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You know, you're arguing for incarceration. Mm -hmm. They're incarcerated, and they're innocent. So yeah. you're still removing all their freedoms, yeah. and, and they're in it. It's just part of how systems go. And is it great? No, it is not. And you're yeah. going to go, well, it's a bigger deal because you're killing them. In, in yeah. my opinion, no, it's not. But... Uh, yeah, and in my opinion, so, yes. my gosh, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Beca now, because, because a... <clears throat> now, if a person sits in jail for 20 years for a crime they did not commit, and they eventually exonerated... First of all, I think it's just a travesty of, I, I don't know exactly what happens, but from my understanding, like that person is not like recompensed much, which no. to me is an absolute travesty of yeah. justice to begin with. But that it's does, one yeah. thing. We don't throw out the system. <clears throat> it's one thing for a guy <clears throat> or gal to sit in jail for, for months, weeks, months, years, mm -hmm. whatever, and then DNA evidence, whatever the yes. case may be, they are exonerated. Yes. Not Simply found not guilty, Absolutely. but they are exonerated where yes. it is any reasonable person would say they're, they're not guilty. Yes. It is one person to say, well, that person has given up some of their, some of their life. It's another thing to say that person's dead now. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I mean, to me, if you're going to be, if you're going to imprison people or, or think of it in terms of, of punishment for your children, mm -hmm. if you are going to, if I am going to punish a, one of my children mm -hmm. by taking away one of his toys for a day. Yes. That standard of like, how sure do I need to be that I am, mm -hmm. I am, I'm, I'm handing out just punishment here. Yes. Now I want to be sure. Regardless. Room for error. Right. Like the room for error there mm -hmm. is much greater than if I'm going to say, say I had an older child and I say, well, I'm going to take away your phone and ground you for two weeks. Right. Like that's like, I need to be much more sure yes. in that case. Yes. And in, in, in cases of the death penalty, I mean, we've got, again, an exoneration for every 10 execution. We're getting that wrong 10% of the time. A parent who needlessly grounds their child 10% mm -hmm. of the time, we're like, okay, you need to like get your act together before you start grounding people again. Mm -hmm. So I would say 
if we're gonna we can take the theology and practical concerns out of it at the very least we need to get that figured out before we execute people <laughs> okay so here's my challenge in this whole debate okay. we're arguing that we have a very poor process uh-huh um, for example, you know me uh-huh. and the whole racial bias thing uh-huh. and the poor bias that's yep. in our system mm-hmm. angers me to no end. Mm-hmm. That is a whole nother issue where I have a problem with that. Yeah, That's got nothing to do with the concept of whether or not the death penalty is appropriate or not. Because here's the other argument that keeps flipping your argument on its head. Okay, You go, it's way more expensive and it's all these appeals and all these appeals and all these appeals. Okay, then clearly we're not getting things right even with all the appeals. Mm-hmm. It's just not getting right. Mm-hmm. If 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 you're saying if you go through all those appeals and have three different court sessions with different judges, with different everything, and you still can't get that person exonerated, mm-hmm. that's not a problem with the death penalty. That's a problem with a bias in a system that's not looking at facts. Right. Okay. But that has, <laughs> and as long as that exists, we shouldn't be killing people. That's okay. what I'm saying. But then we shouldn't do any punishment because because once again. All punishment is going to have room for error. What mm-hmm. I'm telling you is it doesn't say whether or not the death penalty is right or wrong. Mm-hmm. It says, because if you truly want to get it right, mm-hmm. dude, the process we have right now is overkill. Mm-hmm. We have them for 20 years being reanalyzed. Mm-hmm. How much reanalyzation do you need to do to be right? I'm going to say it's not 20 years. Yeah. I- and, and yet, so... What I'm saying is they do not attach whether or not the death penalty is an appropriate forfeiture Mm -hmm. or whether or not we have human error Mm -hmm. or whether or not we have a broken process system. Mm -hmm. Those are actually separate issues, in my opinion. Um, Okay, let me go to one last thing. Okay. So here... And so uh, I understand a lot of your your arguments. Of course, I've I've clearly said I disagree (laughs) on a lot of them. But here's the one that I don't understand. Okay. You said harsh punishments clearly reduce crime, but mm-hmm. the death penalty doesn't. Mm-hmm. The death penalty is a harsh punishment. That it, is true. It, that is a complete yeah. fall apart of the of the argument. Uh, let me clarify, because okay. I don't think it is. Uh, okay. uh, let's. Um, uh, this is a, a crude analogy, but it's the best I got, so we're gonna make it work. Yep. Um, let's say we're, we're we are uh, we're ranking. The, the severity of punishment on a scale of one to 10. Yes. Uh, one is a slap on the wrist. 10 is yes. uh, lethal injection. Yep. Uh, each level of punishment deters additional crime. If I am not afraid for my safety and I believe I can drive safely at 120 miles an hour and it is only going to cost me a $5 fine and I really need to go because for whatever reason, yeah, I'll probably take that risk. Mm-hmm. If I know I'm going to be executed, nah, probably not. If I know, or or take the, let's take that back. Mm-hmm. If I know I'm going to have to spend a week in jail, mm-hmm. if I know I'm going to lose my license, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do it. So, so the severity of punishment certainly acts as a as a deterrent. Yes. But I think that when you get to particular crime, like I just don't believe that there is a person out there who would say I would be willing to kill somebody because it would cost me my life. That I don't think there's a person who would be deterred by that, who would not also be deterred by, I am going to have to spend the rest of my life in jail if I do this. My life is effectively over in terms of free participation in a civil society. I don't believe that difference like deters crime. There's nobody who says, oh, well, I'm going to go kill him. I mean, what? What? they're not going to kill me. They're just going to put me in jail for the rest of my life. I just don't I, think that person exists. Oh, I think they exist really? all over the place. There are whole... If you look at... Resi- uh, when you look at the, the statistics for people going through the jail system, they work with the jail system. They know they get incarcerated. They know they get out. Mm-hmm. The carceration is part of the process. And if they knew their life was going to be ended, there is no, let's do it again. There is no, that is part of our system, we go through it. Hey, I'm part of a gang. I end up killing this person. I'm ultimately going to get out after 25 years, mm-hmm. but I'm part of the gang. It's what I needed to do. And then I go continue on in my life. That is part of the process. But what if they know they're going to be in jail for the rest of their life? It, then what happens is they then run the gang from the jail. So there's still connections. As long as they're in jail, they're still doing their operations. They still have a quality of life and be able to carry out their criminal operations from prison for the rest of their lives. Their life has not been ultimately 
too far affected. Some of them are so used to being in prison, they would rather be in prison than out of prison. Well, to me, then I think again, that that speaks to the <clears throat> that's a systems problem, not a well. We should just kill them so they can't keep running the gang from the pr- if people are running gangs from the prisons. Like to me, that's not a well. Let's just kill all the murderers. Then to me, that is a let's figure out why the heck we're still able to like these people are still able to wreck terror from jail. But if but if you're going to argue that the that we don't want to do the death penalty because the system's broken. The, the the punishment that you're trying to say is not sufficient forfeiture for the crime. Okay, l- let me let me let okay. me do this last piece because right. yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a lot. All right. Okay. So here we go. And and I I warned you about <laughs> and this before. And we're already at seventy minutes. <laughs> yes. I already warned you about this before, so yep. I'm gonna warn the the listeners. What I'm about to say is disturbing. And what I wanted to do was bring it back in to saying we're doing everything theoretically. Okay. There are real things that are going on in this world. And as you know, I listen to true crime a lot. I'm consistently mm-hmm. involved in this conversation. Mm-hmm. And so I'm hearing about victims' families, and I'm, I listen to hundreds of hours of it. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm pretty well versed in this stuff. Mm-hmm. So let me just give you one simple example. Okay. On Tuesday, July 21st in 2009, um, an eight-year-old girl, Victoria Stafford, was found naked from the waist down wearing only a Hannah Montana t-shirt and a pair of butterfly earrings from her mom. What they found out was a boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, one, the lady was 18. The guy was 28. They came and found a little girl because they had a rape fantasy that they wanted to torture and kill a young girl. And so he sent the 18-year-old lady to go to her at school and promised her to come show her her puppies. The little girl then walked hand in hand. He then took her out. They both took her out. He raped her repeatedly. The girl helped her then go to the bathroom, come back in, be raped more and more and more in a field. Then, with a claw hammer, they beat her body, which include lacerations to her liver, broken ribs, eventual death, repeated blows to the head. They beat her to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, that right there, we are now in emotion. Mm-hmm. That emotion right there, you do not get to violate every element of our agreed upon society. Uh, senior mothers preying on young girls, mm-hmm. promising puppies, helping rape. You yeah. do not. Yeah. get to do that mm-hmm. in our society without great forfeiture. Mm-hmm. You have violated every other agreement that we all have for a civil society. Yeah. To do that, you forfeit your life. You do not get to beat little girls with claw hammers and still get to hang out in prison. Mm-hmm. That is unacceptable to me. So when I start getting, you know, obviously you hear the passion, sure. right? Okay, this is what we're talking about. It's yeah. not distance. Yeah. It's this stuff happening yeah. every day, yeah. and we're our... So, there you go. That is where I get very personal. <laughs> yeah, and that story is... is there, there are no words for it. It is disgusting. It is appalling. It is, it is pure evil if there ever, if there ever was one. Um, yeah. How would I respond in that situation? I, I don't know. Uh, does every does every effort need to be taken to care for the victim's family? Yeah. Should people who commit crimes like that be able to be, quote unquote, you know, th- this wasn't exactly what you said, but the idea of should they be able to be comfortable in jail for the rest of their lives? Right. No, they, sh- they should not be. Like that should not be a comfortable existence yes. for them. There needs to be a removal from society. There needs to be a removal of, of rights. I mean, I, I think that these stories are unbelievably emotive they're they're disgusting and they're visceral and that and was not thought, to manipulate yeah. no i understand I'm just that trying and, to no, be very careful sure no and i i think you can i mean you you can that story doesn't change my position and that's you know that's, and i know that wasn't the point but uh well in in yeah. a sense i'm 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 in a sense i don't know how it, it, i uh, let's just use it as an exclamation point of my point yeah sure which is the, it is a forfeiture yeah. of a right. Yeah. It's a forfeiture of presence being given to you. Yeah. To me, it is entirely appropriate to say for what you have done, you are forfeiting your ability to receive blessing from society. We yeah. will not give you food. 
We will not give you a cot. Yeah. We will not give you a safe little place. Mm-hmm. We're not going to care for you. You don't have access to books. You don't get to watch TV. Mm-hmm. You don't get to do any of those things. What you did was over a line. You will forfeit your life. You cannot give it to us. We will take it from you because that is a complete violation of human interaction. Yeah. So that would be an explanation point of saying it's not about personal vengeance. It's not about, it's going, you went beyond a line. Yeah. There is a cost to that. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, yeah, and and obviously nobody's disputing that there should be a significant and severe severe cost, and uh, you know, and I and I, I like I, it's not hard for me to sit here and listen to you and and understand. Like I get it. Like I you know, and right. I and I think that anybody would would agree with that. I think that um and 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 something that we've sort of batted around a little bit, but we haven't adjusted or we haven't addressed specifically is just even even the idea of okay, we live in a secular society with a secular set of laws that you know influenced by you know Judeo Christian ethics, but you know we're a pluralistic you know whatever. You world with lots of different ideas. So, so to what extent is the the operation of the state and the extent to which that should be influenced by Christian ethics? I mean, that, that's a whole other conversation, but um, but let me, I just want to talk about it from a faith perspective is, is you know, and again, I like, I like that story is discussed. You're going to freaking give me nightmares about that. Story. I, I'm so this sorry. This is why dude. I don't listen to your podcast. I know. I'm very sorry. But um, but 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 here, here's here's sort of my my flip side and and why I think Christians can do better than demanding the death penalty for those who do terrible uh-huh. things is is I remember right after that horrific shooting in I want to say Charleston was that in the AME church where the the young Caucasian individual open yeah. fire in the middle of a Bible study. Yes. And I I don't I never go to the car wash, but for some reason I was at the car wash the day or two after and you know how they sit you in the gift shop while your car's going yeah. through and the whole deal. And I'm sitting there with my wife and we're just we're watching the TV and this guy is making his first court case. And every single I mean these situations of of gun violence like every single one of them just makes me sick to my stomach. Mm-hmm. It is just it is disgusting. It is terrible. You know, there are no words for it. And I remember sitting there as this guy's making his court appearance and relatives of the victims are standing up to talk to him one, one after another, after another. And this is not, these people did not have like months and years to, to sort (laughs) through their feelings and sit with their pastors and pray and all this other stuff. This is like a day or two later and person after person after person with tears in their eyes, Mm -hmm. expressing pain expressing hurt, Mm -hmm. expressing devastation, Mm -hmm. and talking about the forgiveness Mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Yes. And I thought, this is, I'm, whatever, it doesn't matter, some news channel. And the nation is seeing Christian witness Mm -hmm. in the face of disgusting evil. And that, to me, is powerful. Uh, Now, whose story is better? It, that doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But I think that that is a big thing, you know, and I, that doesn't, like, m- the force of my story does not negate the force of yours or vice versa. But to me, I think there is tremendous power, and at least as Christians, we can talk about the, the secular society, you know, it's, a, it's, it's part of this conversation, of course, but as Christians to say, our response is not going to stand up, to be to stand up in front of those who commit heinous crimes and say, man, I hope you burn. Our response is not going to be, It's not going to be, man, I can't wait for you to fry or, you know, die or whatever. Our response is because Christ has forgiven me, I can stand here in my pain and forgive you. I I don't think the world has a category for that. And I think it makes a real difference. So, so even if we're going to, even if we're going to talk about society and what society does, my hope would be that as Christ followers, we would be so impacted by forgiveness ourselves and we would be so formed into forgiving people that we would have the ability to do something like that. Okay, so um, I think, once again, we're back to the fundamental difference between you and I, Mm -hmm. which is you see those as exclusive stories. I don't. I see them exactly the same. So I think it is not appropriate or fair for the state to put it on the victim's families to try to determine the the punishment of the person. I think the state needs to handle it and take it off the victim's family's chest and the victim's families get to walk through the forgiveness process. Mm -hmm. I don't see them as mutually exclusive whatsoever. The victim's families have nothing to do with his punishment in society. They're still supposed to do all that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Everything you just said 
is 100% in alignment mm. with what I was just saying. I think that I agree with every piece of it. Mm-hmm. Of course that's what we're supposed to do. I'm not allowed just because if someone dares harm my family, I'm not allowed to just do whatever vengeance I want to do. Mm-hmm. I would never argue that. Mm-hmm. I would always argue that the greater testimony is to do what Jesus did. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is those are not mutually exclusive. They align because the families are not the ones killing the person. That's not yeah. the point. And I guess you can say they're not mutually exclusive. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say they align, only to say uh, that I think it's 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 one it's one thing to be able to say uh, whatever the state may do, I don't want this for you. Which is a separate conversation than policy. To say I don't want you as a victim, as a loved one of a victim, I do not want you to be executed. I don't know. You're okay, right. That's now not you their just, choice. Okay. You just split me, off from me right there. I think that that's because that's know. not what I would say. Uh-huh. I would say, I forgive you. I do not hold harm. Mm-hmm. I still believe you need to be executed. Mm-hmm. That is, that is the split because it's not a personal issue. Mm-hmm. It's saying, I don't want you. You don't, you don't, I don't have hate for you in my heart. Mm-hmm. I forgive you. Your responsibility is to die. I forgive you 100% and I don't want you carrying it as if there's any weight coming from my chest to you. I want you free. I still believe it is appropriate in our society that you forfeit your life because of what you have done. So to me, they're not, that's where we, mm-hmm. we would obviously diverge. It's not a personal thing for yeah. me. Okay. Well, there it is. Two perspectives <laughs> on the death penalty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could sit here and go back and forth all day. Uh, I'll let you kind of have the uh, the last the last word on that. And and again, I hope for our for our listeners. At the end of the day, I, I think the biggest thing uh, you know for me, and I, you know, I'll let you speak to this as well. Is it, wh- whoever you agree with, I hope that you recognize that there is a um, we as uh, those of us who are Christians are a part of a rich tradition that has walked through these issues in a variety of ways. I mean, you can read books and articles and all sorts of stuff from Christians arguing the points that land and I have made. Um, but, the, but the fact of the matter is we are a community of people who are called to wrestle through these issues together. And there's not always necessarily one like, you know, like this is what we all think about this nope. issue. I mean, the key theological truth of our faith obviously are a different story, but there's lots of ways to walk through some of this, uh, some of this stuff. Yeah. The only bottom line as I would close out is um, in no way does this affect my relationship or my love for Pastor Brian. <laughs> I, lit- I respect this guy a ton and I still do. And so what I want to just tell our listeners is as we close out, is there are always different ways to look at a scenario. Mm -hmm. There's always a Pastor Brian and Pastor Lance difference out there. So whatever you are currently looking at right now, and you're saying that other person is evil because they disagree with me, please put this context. Oh, I wonder if there is a Pastor Brian and a Pastor Lance, both gentlemen I love, Mm -hmm. but they disagree. Yeah. I just want us to remember there's a lot of this going on in society and no one's willing to have the dialogue. Right. And no one's willing to get up and we're just like, we're not going to keep arguing about this for the next two hours. We're going to go do other things. So it's all good. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks Lance. I, you know, it's funny. Someone emailed us after the gun podcast and said that was the first time where I felt like there was palpable disagreement between the two of you. And and I felt like it was pretty, pretty mild. And I told the guy, I said, uh, it's going to ratchet up a bit in the next uh, couple episodes. So, but that's fun. Hope it was helpful to those of you who, who listened. Um, our next episode, we're actually going to be taking a break from this series. We'll be inviting uh, a gentleman who is on the, the science faculty at Sierra College on with us just to discuss uh, the relationship between Christianity and uh, issues of science. So that's going to be a really interesting conversation. Watch for that during the first week of April. Thanks to Lucian Hughes, our audio engineer. Thanks to Brennan Stewart, our video director. Excellent work as always, gentlemen. Thanks to Lance. Thanks to those of you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks for the next episode of Engaging Culture. Thank you for listening to Engaging Culture, a podcast by Bridgeway Christian Church. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Music is used under the Creative Commons license and is provided by Dexter Britton.